In this unit, let's look at the structure of linear functions of many variables and linear inequalities that are formed with those functions. Let's start with linear inequalities. In the diet problem, we saw that the choices for the amounts of each food are constrained by several linear inequalities. These were in this form. The left-hand side of each equation represented the amount of a particular nutrient consumed by eating the various amounts of food. And the right-hand side was a minimum daily requirement. Therefore, the goal was to have the amount consumed greater than the daily requirement. If we multiply these equations by negative 1, then trivially, the greater than or equal sign switches to a less than or equal sign, and they all have the following form involving a less than or equal to, which is clearly equivalent, but it's more conventional to use less than or equal to, so we'll use that convention. Although we didn't formulate it in the diet problem, it would have also been natural to have upper bound inequalities for undesirable contents, suppose saturated fat. So here I've written an equation where the amount of saturated fat consumed by consuming the various amounts of food should be less than or equal to some r tilde sub k. The point here is that in the natural problem formulation, there will be many linear inequalities. Some will involve greater than or equal to, some will involve less than or equal to. Simply by multiplying by negative one or moving terms from one side of the equation to the other, they can all be expressed as linear combinations of the decision variables should be less than or equal to a given fixed quantity. And that's the convention that we'll use from here on. The other convention that we'll use is that the general notation for the choice variables, the decision variables, will be x rather than a. a here was used because it represented an amount, and a is the first letter of the word amount. But in general, we'll use the letter x, x1, x2, up through xn for decision variables. So from now on, when we're talking about a general discussion, letter x will represent decision variables. Let's now look at the structure of linear inequalities by looking at some two-dimensional examples. We'll use x1 and x2. There's the Cartesian plane. Let's look at the inequality 2x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 2. Well, that's satisfied for all x's over here in the blue region. Get a piece of paper and sketch that and make sure you agree that the set of x in the blue region does satisfy the inequality. The line is precisely the set of points that satisfy 2x1 plus x2 equal to 2. And above the line are those points such that 2x1 plus x2 is greater than 2. Notice that the red line, which are those points which satisfy 2x1 plus x2 equal to 2, divides the two-dimensional plane into two regions, those where 2x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 2, and those where 2x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 2. We'll call those sets half spaces, and I'm going to focus on the half space where the inequality is satisfied. So I'll label that blue side a half space. Let's look at another but different inequality. Here's the inequality. Negative x2 is less than or equal to 1. Of course, if I multiply by negative 1, that's x2 is greater than negative 1. And the set of points satisfying that are also half space. The red line where x2 equals 1 divides the plane into two regions. How about another inequality? Negative x1 minus x2 is less than or equal to 1. That's over here. Again, a half space. And finally, negative x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 1. And that's over in this region, another half space. So here we have four linear inequalities. The set of points which satisfy each one of them individually is a half space. What about the set of points that satisfy all four of these inequalities, meaning the intersection? Well, that just looks like this polytope. It's the intersection of those four half spaces, and in fact, we'll call it the feasible set of these four inequalities. Any point in that blue shaded region, the polytope, satisfies all four of the inequalities, and any point outside violates at least one of them. The feasible set of the inequalities are only those points which satisfy all of the inequalities.
Now that we understand the structure of a system of linear inequalities, let's look at the structure of linear functions. In the diet problem, the choices for the amounts of each food to eat lead to a cost, which is a linear function of the amounts. Here I'm writing f of a, a is the amounts, is a linear combination of the a's, the coefficients given by the prices. For the rest of this slide, let's use x as the general notation for the decision variables, not a's. And the question we want to address is what is the structure of linear functions? Here's a linear function, f of x is c transpose x, where c is a given vector. In two dimensions, that's c1 x1 plus c2 x2. Here's a diagram of the Cartesian plane, x1 x2, and there's a diagram of the vector c, the component c1 and the component c2. Now let's consider values of x only along c, in other words, on that line. So x is alpha times c, where alpha is a real number, zero, positive, or negative. What's the value of f of x at those locations? Well, f of x then becomes simply alpha times c transpose c. Let's take c as I've drawn, the vector 2, negative 1. Then c transpose c is 5, and therefore, if x is 0 times c at the origin, f of x is 0. If x is 1 fifth c, so go 1 fifth along that brown vector, then f of x will equal 1. If x is 2 fifths c, f will equal 2. At 3 fifths c, f will equal 3, and so on. At k over 5 c, f of x equals k. There it is for 4 fifths c, f equals 4, 5 fifths c, f equals 5, and negative 1 fifth c, f equals negative 1. So a linear function of many variables behaves linearly along the direction given by the coefficients. That's not surprising. What about in the other directions? Here's the pertinent drawing from before. Now let's take a particular point, x1 equal negative c2, and x2 equals c1. Then f of x, defined as c transpose x, is negative c1 c2 plus c2 c1, which equals 0. Let's call this vector negative c2 c1 c perp. Let me graph that. Negative c2 in the x1 direction and c1 in the x2 direction. And recalling that c is just c1 c2, we confirm again that c transpose c perp is indeed 0. Now, remember that rotating rise run by 90 degrees flips the role of rise and run, and it also gives one of them a negative sign. So, c perp is just a vector perpendicular to c and rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise. Moreover, on this slide, let's consider x values that are both along c and c perp. Whereas, remember on the previous slide, we only considered vectors x along c. Here, if x is some combination of c and c perp, let's compute the value of f of x. f of x is c transpose times x. Move the c transpose through and pull out the scalars. That's alpha c transpose c plus beta c transpose c perp but we know that c transpose c perp is zero. So this is again simply alpha c transpose c. f has no dependence in the c perp direction. The function value is constant along lines in that direction. Let's visualize that. Remember that the function was zero at the origin. Well, it's actually zero along the entire line passing through the origin in the c perp direction. The function value is one at x equal one fifth c, well, it's actually 1 at all points along the line passing through 1 fifth c. And 2, and 3, and 4, and 5, and 6, and negative 1. So f varies very simply in the direction of c and has no dependence in the direction of c perp. That's the common structure of linear functions. In higher dimensions, it's not just one direction where there's no dependence, but there's actually m minus 1 directions where there's no dependence. In m dimensions, there's an m minus 1 dimensional plane, which is perpendicular to c, and the function c transpose x has no dependence in those directions of the plane. 
Here, the plane was simply a one-dimensional plane. It was the plane given by C perp. Now we can visualize solutions to these types of optimization problems. Let's visualize one to a problem with two variables and four constraints. The problem is minimize 2x1 minus x2 subject to these four inequality constraints. These are the four inequality constraints we looked at earlier. Therefore, the feasible set, the set of points satisfying those inequality constraints, is simply that blue polytope. There it is, the feasible polytope. We're trying to minimize a function of the form C transpose X, where C1 is 2 and C2 is negative 1. That's the linear function we've already studied. There's the direction C. We know that F increases linearly along the direction C and has no dependence perpendicular to the direction C. Therefore, 2x1 minus x2 is 0 in that location. It's 1 along those lines. There are some feasible points that achieve 1. It's 2 along those lines. There are some blue points that achieve 2, and so on. But we're trying to minimize F, not maximize it. So let's go the other direction. Let's go negative 1. There are some feasible points that achieve negative 1. There's also a single feasible point that achieves a cost of negative 2. And if we move any farther, we won't be in the feasible polytope. Therefore, the solution to this problem is that the minimum is negative 2, and it's achieved at the point x1 equals negative 1, x2 equals 0, which is exactly that vertex point of the feasible polytope. It's clear from this visualization that in all these problems, an optimal solution will occur at one of the vertices of the feasible polytope. Well, that's true even in high-dimensional problems. An optimal solution is always at a vertex of the feasible polytope. 